Okay, so Anzal Dua, um, this is, and oh, one more thing, I need to share my screen, right? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen here. And now I can do this. All right. Oh, okay, there we go, that works. All right, so um, Anzal Dua is a little, it's very interesting because um, in a way it's a summary of a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about, but it's also a departure. It's a little bit different. She's not an anthropologist. She's not a sociologist. I think she was training to be an anthropologist when she died, but her readings, her, her writings that she works, that she is known for um, are definitely not, you know, not something you would call typical anthropology, but a lot of anthropologists were drawn to her work just because she seems to, she, she has read a lot. It seems like she's read a lot of theory um, and it's integrated there, but it's also combined with things like poetry. Um, she does, um, well, some of this is poetry. Uh, she switches, in some cases in this book, she switches back and forth between English and Spanish, but there's a point to that. She doesn't translate it always um, because she's making this point about border identities that this is how I talk. This is my... You know, this is my native tongue and it's been beaten out of me almost literally. Right. So. Um, so there's a lot. Of, it's a it's a difficult text. Um, you know, I'll just tell you, like my the first this is the first book I had to read when I started grad school in anthropology. Um, it was in a class about cultural theory, I think. And it just freaked me out uh, because I didn't know, you know, I came from a four field departments like most of you. And yeah, this didn't seem like anthropology at all. And I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I wasn't familiar with these theories, but. Um, so it freaked me out. I didn't like it at the time, but then once I became a professor and started teaching, I went back to it and was like, oh, okay, now I get it. Once I started teaching about identity, I was like, oh, okay, now I see why so many people love this book. Um, and so I'm going to walk you through her argument. It's really not, it's kind of difficult to discuss, to lecture about. So I'm just going to walk you through her argument and there are going to be some terms you might not be familiar with. I'll try to explain them when we get there. Uh, I only assigned the intro in chapter one. I used to assign chapter three and four, and you probably will be, if you're interested in what you see here, you might want to read those two and I can post them later, but I'm not holding you responsible for them. Although if we get that far, I'll, I'll bring those back too. Uh, I'll talk about those too, because there's some really important concepts in chapters two and three. So, um, right, so the book is Borderlands, La Frontera, which is Borderlands in Spanish, right? I don't speak Spanish, so I might struggle with some of these words. Um, so, all right, so some key terms that you might need to be familiar with. Liminality, if you're an anthro major, you should be familiar with that term, this situation of being betwixt and between. Um, being not one thing and not yet the other thing, but being in this middle, this kind of, you can see how that would relate to border identities because she's talking about border identities as being someone suspended between one thing and not the other. In her case, Mexican versus Spanish, straight versus, you know, a heterosexual versus homosexual, um, male versus female in her case. Um, so all of these different things, she's basically trying to map out the terrain of what is it like to be a border person, someone who doesn't fit all of these categories that we've been talking about, like race, ethnic like race and ethnicity, sexuality and gender. What if you don't fit any of them? Is that a disability or is it a source of power? And so her, her work, she tries to take something that it can be crippling, it can be paralyzing and point out how powerful it can be, right? So liminality is really important to that because that's a really important anthropological term. Um, it's a really important anthropological term because it comes from rites of passage where you're being initiated into something. You're not the old thing, but you're also not the new thing uh, yet. Um, and so in some ways, yeah, it's a very bad position to be in because you're being abused. You, you don't have a frame of reference. You don't have a foundation for who you are. You don't have social status. But at the same time, even older anthropological studies realize that liminality is also a position of power because you don't have social constraints, right? Um, you are this raw human form that can be anything like you have it has capabilities right it has you're uncontrollable right um, until they give you a new status it's really difficult to control people going through a rite of passage or being initiated into something and so um, all the social constraints would come that come with being a cultural human um, are stripped away from you in the process of that and so this 
state, the status of being liminal can be very powerful. Right? Um, so as long as you recognize that. Okay. So colonialism, you're familiar with nationalism, primordialism, and she, her work could be described as primordialist, like, because she's going to strip everything away from herself and try to revive things that are there. So primordialism, if you remember, I think I talked about it briefly about ethnicity, um, is this idea that we're born with certain aspects of our identity, right? So it's kind of a, um, an old school term, but, um, and autochthonous is just um, Latin for, it means it's, it means something from the earth, from the ground. Like she's gonna try to revive autochthonous accept, um, aspects of her identity as a woman or as a, a, a queer woman. Uh, and try to like some of the gods that were suppressed by the by the conquistadors um, and use them and even use them against her the things that the, um, I don't know the misogynistic parts of her own culture like even before the Europeans came right so she gets into that uh, symbolic violence just um, pretty self-explanatory right violence but in the the realm of culture and ideas um, Homeland, gender, sexuality, subject. So the rest of these, your cultural imperialism, right? Um, she actually coins this phrase, which I love, intimate violence. She talks about the violence of home, right? How home is can be a very powerful place to retreat to when you're being discriminated against. But in her case, she's going to point out how home for her, this imagined homeland, um, was also a place of violence, right? And so get to that later. Okay, so... She, the intro chapter one, the homeland, Aslan, um, you know, I like to start with this quote because she, you know, it really, you know, her work just disrupts so many things that we've been talking about, um, about nationalism, about how maps can kind of naturalize relationships between people, uh, things like that. So she talks about how um, this quote is actually not, it is, I think it's from the epitaph of this book. Uh, it was actually placed on a statue. Um, there's a statue, uh, I can't remember what the statue is, in a park in Los Angeles. And about 12 years ago, they they, they erected this monument uh, to Los Angeles' Mexican heritage, right? And it's in a park in Los Angeles, and they put this on the base of the statue, and it just started all kinds of controversies, right? Um, and, you know, so I mean, look at it. That's pretty. That's pretty aggressive, right? Like this land was Mexican once, was Indian always, and is, and will be again, right? So it just flies in the face of American nationalism that this is naturally a part of America, right? Because as she does in this historical part that she talks about, um, in the historical parts of this book, you know, she's trying to re she's trying to resist america uh history that has been written from this american nationalist perspective um and so she's going to go through that so think about all the way back to nationalism how nationalist stories right it's all about storytelling right they put people in a place and then they give it a calendar like this is you know this is naturally where these people belong and here's the time frame from it well she's trying to disrupt that by pointing out that you know there's she's going to talk about immigration later she's going to say that if you Take look at the big picture. This movement of people from Mexico to the U.S. is just part of a larger pattern. You just have to step outside this framework of American nationalism. So get to that. Um, and here's another thing. This is one of the in, among academics. This is probably the most famous quote from the book. Um, the U.S.-Mexican borders and um, una herida abierta. Again, I don't speak Spanish, but like uh, it's an open wound, right? Where the third world grates against the first and bleeds, right? So I love that imagery. So her image, this is one of the things that people love about this book. It's like the imagery she uses is so vivid that, you know, it's where the third world grates against the first world and, and the third world bleeds, right? So, um, and before scab forms, it hemorrhages again, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. And so she's saying, the lifeblood of America and the U.S. scrapes against, you know, they mix together in this area, you know, before, um, before a scab can form. And so the third world grates against the first world. It bleeds and that blood mingles together to create something called a third culture, a, a third country, a border culture, she calls it. And so, you know, there's a whole field in identity studies about border identities. And this is one of the this is one of the most important texts in it. Um, so she's going to try to map out 
how do you tell your story when you don't have a nation, when you don't have an ethnicity, technically, when you don't have a categ an official category? What do you use to tell your story? Well, that's what she's trying to do here with, with trying to map out her own border identity. So it's an ambitious project. Um, for her, it's a very personal project, which is kind of an interesting thing about this. Like that's one of the things that makes it a little less anthropological is that she does it from her own personal perspective. But the key is that you can people from a lot of their borders everywhere. And one of the midterm questions like uh, for midterm three is going to be, think about your own, everybody lives on some kind of border, whether it's African American, Asian American, queer, bisexual, um, someone who's Christian, but agnostic, someone who's atheist, you know, it's like everyone lives on some kind of identity border. And so this can be a really good blueprint for how do you think about it, for thinking through these topics of, of not fitting in either world and kind of mixing both. Um, okay, so border identities relies on the concept of liminality that I just talked about, and they straddle the category so important to subject making. So subject making, there's that term from, uh, there's that, that term from, uh, from Foucault and, and um, post-structuralism, right, that people aren't, you know, you're trained to be certain identities, you're giving these menu choices, um, who makes the menu choices that you can choose from to form your identity. So, um, and so the cat is, so how do you talk about, how do you even write about an identity that doesn't fit any official categories on either side, you're just defective to everybody, right? So, um, She's going to talk about that. There's a later chapter in the book where she talks, uses language to talk about it. Basically. So, so what is a borderland? And so she defines a borderland as a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an un, residue of an unnatural boundary. It's in a constant state of transition. Uh, the prohibited and forbidden are its inhabitants. And so the prohibited and for and forbidden are its inhabitants. Right. So what that refers to is what is it like to be a person who is prohibited and forbidden it from across all these categories? So, um, it's an, un, the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. So there again, she's critiquing nationalism, even though she doesn't put it in these terms, that's basically what she's doing. She's critiquing the idea of how nationalisms draw boundaries between people and places and, and, and present them as being natural. Right. So, uh, I remember earlier in the class, I talked about how, how elementary and middle school geography teachers will say that. And I don't know if they still do it, but they'll talk about how, you know, the Rio Grande is, um, is a natural border between the U.S. and, and the U.S., between Texas and Mexico, uh, which is could be further from the truth. You know, that border was drawn there through warfare and theft and intrigue and colonialism and all these other things. The very, you know, all borders have violent histories behind them. They're not just natural. None of them are natural. So, um, so she calls it an unnatural boundary here. Um, okay. Okay. So... So now she's, she gets into this history of like, how did the border become where it is? How did Mexico, you know, she's going to, her history, the way she does it, it has different layers about it. And so um, she talks about, I mean, you would expect that she would talk about the conquistadors and Cortez and, you know, invading Mexico and fighting with the, the Maya um, and conquering uh, was it the Aztecs, right? Um, and conquering them eventually um, that... You know, you would think about that. And like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. But she even goes even further in some of the later chapters. She's going to go even beyond that and talk about the pre-Columbian times, right? That violence was being perpetrated against women even in pre-Columbian cultures, right? Among the Aztecs, um, especially is like one of her focuses. Um, so this is the, it's her entry into history. And, you know, just as a footnote, some people do have a problem with their history, but it's generally accurate. Um, but you know, she even addresses that in the book. It's like, yeah, it's generally accurate, but you know, it's our history. We can do with it what we want. Right. So, um, it's a quote from her, but it is generally accurate. Historians and archeologists may have, may kind of quabble with a few details of it, but generally, yeah, this is kind of what happened. So, um, so she talks about Huitzilopochtli, the God of war. Um, my quiche is not very good either. Right. <laughs> um, she talks about the founding of Mexico here, and, and it's this is still on the Mexican flag, right? You see an eagle holding a serpent in its beak. 
Um, this is where the God of War guided them to the place where an eagle with a writhing serpent in its beak perched on a cactus. Um, for her, and a lot of people would agree, right? The eagle symbolizes the spirit as the son, the father. The serpent symbolizes the soul, the earth, the mother. Together, they symbolize the struggle between the spiritual celestial male and the underworld earth feminine. The symbolic sacrifice of the serpent to the higher masculine powers indicates that the patriarchal order had already vanquished the feminine and matriarchal order in pre-Columbian America. So here is the, the nation state of Mexico celebrating its indigenous history Right. Um, by using, you know, she's questioning, why are you using this image? Well, it's appropriate, right? Because this is what happened. Um, the eagle conquers the serpent and it holds it in his mouth. And this is, you know, according to the mythology, this is where the mythology of the founding of Mexico City. It was this spot that was chosen for a reason. And it's because they saw the symbol, right, that the eagle eating, the killing the serpent. And so she points it out that she's pointing this out, that here is the ultimate symbol of what has happened to women and queer people in the founding of Mexico, even before, you know, even before the conquistadors, right? Even in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, this was already happening. So she takes issue with them too. So she's not just gonna criticize Europeans, she's also gonna tr um, criticize indigenous Mesoamerican people, uh, like the Aztecs and the Incas and the Maya. It's interesting saying that this stuff had already started happening. And so these, her identity as a woman has just been piled on layer after layer of patriarchy, right? And so she's gonna try to strip them away and build something new. That's kind of the best image to think about this book. Um, stripping away layer after layer of oppression, finding out what's there, what's under there, and then reviving it because it was there. It was there in herself and it was also there in the culture, but it's just been um, kind of destroyed or repressed, right? So again, and this fits with post-structuralism in Foucault because you know that's kind of the thing, right? He talks about how when history is built, history is suppressed. So you build history by suppressing other views of it, right? So she's trying to bring, so you could say psychologically, she's trying to revive these aspects of herself that have been forgotten, but you could look at it as a post-structural and say like, yeah, this is kind of what Foucault was talking about. Like these histories of what happened in Mesoamerica, in Mexico, before the conquistadors, and then after the conquistadors, um, these are official histories. Well, what about the other histories? So she's trying to bring back these repressed histories to reclaim parts of herself that have been lost, very powerful parts of herself, right? So again, so I mean, not super anthropological, but it's super interesting, like the way she does. Um, so here in this, this is this, and I'll, you know, you can see this in the film, you can pause it and read these slides. I'm not gonna read all of them, that's boring, but, um, so she talks about how for the Indians that accompany the, the Europeans, the conquistadors looking from the, and the missionaries returning to what we now call the Southwest, right, from Mexico. Um, she said for the Indians that went with them, th this was a return to Aslan, the place of origin. So Aslan referring to, you know, the, the mythical, uh, semi-mythical homeland for uh, Latin American, for a mestizo people or for Mesoamerican peoples, let's put it that way, especially the Aztecs. Uh, thus making Chicanos, and we, the language has kind of changed since he wrote this book in the mid nineties. Uh, Chicanos is still there. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we could have a whole discussion about Chicano versus Latino, Latinx now, right? The language is constantly changing, changing but Chicanos, um, I've had a Chicano explained to me as like particularly political Latino people, right? That are politically active and activist oriented. So um, we had a whole discussion in my class one time about this, but um, uh, so that's making Chicanos originally and secondarily indigenous to the Southwest. So they were originally there, but then there was a second wave of them that came with the conquistadors as they moved North. Um, and um, Indians and Mestizos from Central America uh, from central Mexico intermarried with North American Indians. Um, so the intermarriage between Mexicans and American Indians and Spanish formed an even greater mestizajo. So this is the mestizo people that she's talking about, the people who are, you know, she's not even claiming purity or anything like that. She's saying like, I am a mixture of European, uh, Native American um, people, uh, I guess you would call Central American people, indigenous people. So that, not even trying to separate them, right? This is who I am, right? So border identity. Um, so then she gives us history and just briefly, uh, 1800s, 
Anglos migrated illegally from the northern U.S. from northern parts of the U.S. into Texas, which at that point was part of Mexico. Uh, Mexico fights a war to keep Texas. You know, the Alamo was part of that battle. The, U, the U.S. lost that battle, right? Um, Mexico fights to try to keep Texas. Um, 1846, U.S. incited Mexico. This is her quote. The U.S. incited Mexico to war, invaded and occupied Mexico. They claimed Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and California. So, you know, I put an exclamation point there because those of us who don't grow up in the Southwest in California just aren't aware of how recent this history is, right? That, um, so, um, 1846. So, basically, this is where she's showing you this border is artificial, right? It was, this land was taken. She's not saying it should be given back, at least not directly. But she's saying, like, hey, this history... You know, step outside of your nationalism and recognize how recent this history is and how this is not a natural border. Like, um, I mentioned this in class once, like I didn't realize until I lived in California, I didn't realize that California was even part of Mexico at some point um, and how huge California is, right? And gorgeous. I mean, it's just a gorgeous area. But um, so she's flying in the face of nationalism. It's like, hey, you know, let's look at this from a different perspective. This history is very recent and it's very violent. Um, so this pushed the Texas border down 100 miles to the Rio Grande. So not a natural border, wasn't there before, right? So, um, so the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is from 1948. Uh, this is when, and then it became an official militarized border. Um, 100, and she talks about 100,000 Mexicans stranded in the U.S. And I've heard people say that's kind of a low estimate, but that's kind of an estimate of how many Mexicans were living in the U.S., like in Texas, and like in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and California. Um, that sounds like a low estimate to me, but um, just let's just this. Let's just say a lot of Mexicans were stranded in the U.S. when the border moved. So, again, one of the, or not again, I haven't mentioned this yet, but, you know, one of the slogans for people who, for uh, immigration advocates, you know, and people who advocate for undocumented people in the Southwest, especially, saying that like, I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. And what they're referring to is not them personally. They're saying that this border moves across their families, right? And so that's an important thing to keep in mind as she discusses this, is that these communities didn't move, the border moved, and that a lot of these migration patterns that we keep hearing about, and yeah, labor is a part of it, seeking a better life is a part of it, um, when the south to north migration that we see on the news a lot right now, but she's saying like, hey, get out, step outside of your nationalist gaze and look at this history for what it really is, this is part of a larger migration pattern. It's a cyclical pattern. They've been constantly going south. They go south, they go north. And um, it's a collection of families and lineages that do this. And it's not just individuals making this decision to cross borders. Um, she's saying that we can look at contemporary immigration politics and what's happening as part of a larger pattern that spans a thousand years, right? So if you widen your framework to a thousand years, then all of a sudden it doesn't look so unnatural anymore for people to be moving. So. It's kind of part of it. Um, okay, sorry, losing my screen here. All right, so um, all right, so and this is what she's talking about here. We have a tradition of migration, a traditional long walks. Today, we're witnessing a, um, the migration of the Mexican people, like the return odyssey to the historical mythological Aslan. So Aslan refers to not Mexico, but it's that part that she just mentioned, uh, Texas. Um, Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. That was Aslan. So Aslan is not, doesn't refer to Mexico. It refers to these parts of the U.S. Um, it was kind of the mythological homeland of the Mestizo people like uh, in Mexico. And so this is a return for them. They're not going to a new place. They're returning to an old place, right? So, um, so again, this is what I say. Current, current border politics are part of an older cycle of migration. Um, like she's trying to reclaim time itself from from national from American and Mexican nationalisms. Um, okay, so rebellion, rebellion, and the culture of um, I don't know what is that translating. Okay. So um, all right, so that's that's all for chapter one. I thought I had more for that. Okay, so I'll just flesh out her. So again, I only. 
I only assigned chapter one, but I'm going to go a little bit into chapter two just to help sum up what she's talking about. Um, okay, so you've got the history, you've got the critique of nationalism, uh, you've got her larger project, which is reclaiming parts that were gone. Um, so chapter two is where people, you know, when they're trying to read it, it's like, oh, this is getting a little weird. Uh, but a lot of people do final papers and projects about this because they find it inspiring. Like um, Chapter two is where she starts to her project of reclaiming herself. So she talks about how, and here's the shadow beast, right? There's a rebel in me, the shadow beast. Um, it's the part, and you see the underlying part, it just refuses to take orders, right? It um, Anything that threatens the sovereignty of my rulership as a person, right? It is that part of me that hates constraints of any kind, even those self-imposed. So that's important, right? So not all restraints. So again, that fits with Foucault, right? Like um, the, the Panopticon, you create people that will restrain themselves and that way you don't need to beat them over the head all the time. So uh, people aren't, you know, from the matrix, right? Uh, humans aren't born, they're made, right? They're produced, um, subject made. So that's where the term subject making comes from. It's you're produced to be a kind of person that will restrain yourself, whether that's in terms of race or sexuality or gender. Uh, these things that we've talked about, you will police yourself um, and it will cross over into a lot of different areas of your life. So, um, so she says that it hates constraints of any kind, even those self-imposed. Um, and any hint of limitations on my time or space. So again, time and space, right? So again, that's why I love this book so much. It just touches on all the things that we've talked about. Any hint of limitations on my time or space by others, it kicks out with both feet, bolts, right? So there's just this rebellious thing. She calls it the shadow beast, and she wants to she wants to kind of ignite it. She wants to trigger it, right? So that it can help remake who she is. Um so then, again, now she's getting into cultural politics. Um, culture forms our beliefs. We perceive the version of reality that it communicates. Uh, dominant paradigms, predefined concepts that exist as unquestionable, unchallengeable, or tr transmitted to us through the culture. Um, it's made by those in power, men. Males make the rules and laws. Women transmit them. Okay, that's a little blunt, but yeah. Um, in some ways, like a lot of feminist theories would agree with that, that men generally do make the laws. They compose the culture. Women are given the responsibility of transmitting it through childcare, right? So, um, so she's saying that this is why culture is so powerful pretty much and that's very anthropological right so um okay so now she's talking about she starts to unpack who she is right and so she's saying that as a border person as a person with a border identity there's something compelling about being both male and female about having an entry into both worlds um we suffer from an abs absolute despot duality that says we are able to be only one or the other so she's saying that it's violent for us to be expected to conform to these dualities like male and female, that it represses things. We lose a lot of our humanity by conforming to these two. And so she's going to refuse to do that. Um, these systems like culture claim that human nature is limited and cannot evolve into something better. Right. So why are we as people, as, as culture bound humans, why are we limiting ourselves to one or the other? binary opposites right there has to be more than that humans can evolve to something beyond that um and as a side note a side note if you're if you're god this is just a random thought but if you're anybody watch doctor who <laughs> uh, if you anyway okay check it out doctor who who try time travels like whatever a lot and so sometimes it goes like a thousand years in the future and you'll see that people play with this idea that, that there are, you know, when he encounters people from 2,000 years in the future, you know, like there are, sometimes there are no males and females, right? Even when he's with Earthlings, sometimes it's aliens, but Star Trek used to do this too. Sometimes like just playing because Gene Roddenberry is very progressive in a lot of ways that, you know, they kind of encounter these people and they don't even make a big deal about it. It's just a matter of fact, like um, sexuality is completely different 2,000, 3,000 years in the future, right? So, um Anyway, they play with this idea. So it claims that, he, and so they, and sometimes they tie it into human evolution, right? That eh, it's like, what do you, what, male, he, and they play with pronouns and all this kind of stuff. So, um, all right, nerd alert. So it claims that human nature is limited and cannot evolve into something better. Uh, but I, like other queer people, am two in one body, both male and female. I am the embodiment of the 
Eros Gamos, the coming together of opposite qualities within. So she's basically kind of like the Indian god Kali, right? Is male and female and fell in love with itself, right? So, um, but she's saying that, and this is not a statement. She's not saying that this is how all queer people are. Um, she's saying like other queer people, like some of them, she's not saying that they're all like this, but she considers herself to be male and female. And, uh, if you if we did you did watch the film if you watch the film middle sexes remember like everyone starts out as female and then they turn into male so it's kind of reclaiming that even the personal history at the biological level like hey we've been you know everyone starts out as female and then if then you know if you have this one gene like then a hormone kicks in and then your ovaries drop right and then one thing becomes another thing and so she's saying like let's embrace all that we can be right and why be why not choose both right so um and this is a this is a really important part that people for the lesbian of color the ultimate rebellion she can, she can make against her native cultures through her sexual behavior so again this fits with post-structuralism and foucault sexuality is a very powerful way of controlling people's uh, identity their destiny limiting them um and a lot of Foucault's work, one of his books, The History of Sexuality, looks at how did sex and morality even become related to each other? Like, how did religion, why is religion so focused on sex? Um, you know, some people would argue because it's a very powerful control mechanism, right? Um, so, I guess her, the, for a woman, of, for a lesbian of color, uh, the ultimate rebellion is through sexual behavior. Um, so, she goes against two things, sexuality and homos, you know, her sexuality and sexuality is a category to rebel against homosexuality is a category to represent um you know she's even against the idea of exclusive homosexuality right that and as you saw from the article the uh invention of heterosexuality homosexual both heterosexuality and homosexualities are are completely modern inventions right they've only been around for about 100 years because people didn't define didn't define the world that way um even in places where homosexual practice, homosexuality was banned or repressed it was always you know people still did it it just wasn't officially recognized right and they didn't have a term for being straight or heterosexual right so again these are very recent things um so being raised lesbian and catholic and doctrine in the street i'm and this is a famous part like whenever we talked about this book when i was in grad school this always came up uh she said i she said i made the choice to be queer for some it, it is genetically inherited so inherent so she, you know, people pick that quote apart. Is she saying that all people, you know, no, she's not saying that all queer people choose to be, um, choose to be queer. Some people just are, you know, some people aren't. Some people could be queer and choose not to be, right? So that kind of think that's what she's getting at. Again, it fits with the film, um, with the film Middle Sex is that, you know, human sexuality and gender is very complicated, right? It's very and the more we try to pin it down and define them the more violent violent it is for people who don't comfortably fit these categories right so um it's an interesting path one that slips into and out of the white the catholic the mexican the indigenous the instincts it's a way of balancing of mitigating duality so for her to be queer became a focal point for her identity because it's a way of resisting all these different categories right so it just became a a powerful liminal position so again here's that idea of liminality being powerful right so you know i like to say this when i talk about liminality that you know if spider if in spider-man you know his uncle tells him you know with great power comes resp great responsibility being liminal is a position of no power so with no power comes no responsibility and it kind of gets at the this idea of being free from constraints and resisting things about liminality being a source of power and that's kind of a big thing for her project okay so again she talks more about the shadow beast um the repressed parts of ourselves that we choose the force underground or are or done um or done from someone external it's due to the fear of rejection um and you know the interesting thing and this is what gets really interesting about her work is that she talks about it's there, you know it's there, but we've been socialized to repress it, to not let it break out, to repress queer urges or homosexual urges, or to even just, even if you're not queer, or if there's no aspect of your identity that isn't, to even be open to the idea that other are, other people are, or aspects of yourselves that you're not comfortable with, right? So these things, 
you have to question, you know, basically you have to think about why are you not comfortable with these aspects that you repress, right? So uh, she talks about how some people choose to make themselves conscious of it, see um, and see heterosexual male projections onto it. So for women, and this is an important distinction to make, um, if you go back a couple of slides earlier, she said that the two positions, you know, you're, you're, you're to be a queer, to be a lesbian of color, uh, you're you're resisting two categories. One is sexuality itself and one is heterosexuality. And so um, she's saying here that some people choose to make themselves conscious of it, but then also to reject it because you put this heterosexual male projections or gaze, right? You remember from Panopticon, it's the gaze that makes you police yourself. So um, she's saying that uh, some people choose to make themselves conscious of the shadow beast um, this repressed aspect of the self, um, and you reject it because even if you see it, some people just have totally had it beaten out of them or ground out of them, but some people, they see it's there, but they put heterosexual male projections onto it and reject it, right? This, um, and that could be something like not just homosexuality, but also just for women, sexuality, just, um, finding pleasure in sex and not being afraid of it, not, seeing it as something other than just some, a way to make babies or um, this idea of being labeled, you know, it's like, like oh, I want to have more sex or I'd like to sleep with this person, but I don't want to be labeled a whore. So that's what she's saying. Like, that's where that patriarchy, like that heterosexual male gaze comes in. Um, some choose to make themselves conscious of it. Some try to awaken the shadow beast inside us and confront it. Um, some people will try to actively get rid of it. Um, and this is a quote from her. Not many jump at the chance to confront the shadow beast in the mirror without flinching at her lidless serpent eyes, her cold, clammy, moist hand dragging us underground. Fangs barred and bared and hissing. Should be bared. Uh, bared and hissing. How does one put feathers on this particular serpent? Uh, but a few of us have been lucky on the face of the shadow beast. So we have seen not lust, but tenderness on its face. We have uncovered the lie. So, I mean, it's just brilliant. I just love this book. <laughs> like just her imagery. She's saying that you see this in the mirror and you can either choose to reject it, to repress it. You can violently repress it. Or, and she says that some of us have recognized that they don't see terror. You know, it doesn't terrorize them. They see tenderness. Um, they can identify with it. And they can say, this is not a monster, right? So, you know, this is one of the things that's so brilliant about this passage, I think, is how it, you know, those of us, when I was in college, I was really interested in mythology. I was a religious studies minor and, you know, I studied a lot about myth about world mythology and things. I just, I still find it interesting, but, um, you know, one of the, the recurring imagery images in world mythology is the dragon in one way or another right and so what is a dragon a dragon is a serpent with wings right um and so what is the so in a lot of places snakes especially in the middle east right um with our judeo-christian general cultural heritage right snakes are usually seen as evil right they're of the earth they are tempting they you know satan took the form of a snake to tempt adam and eve right so um it's seen as as forbidden it's taboo uh whereas angels have wings right so you take the wings from the angels you put them on a snake and you can have a more complete person i don't know if that makes sense but um so she's questioning here how, how does one put feathers on this particular serpent um but she's saying she's one of the lucky ones like i look at its face if you actually look at it closely there's nothing inherently evil about the serpent and in fact what she does is she's in later chapters she talks about how some of the pre-columbian gods in mesoamerica were feminine and there were serpents and it was the coming of catholicism and christianity that turned them into evil and that i mean they had their issues before the europeans again but especially after the europeans when they brought catholicism uh, catholicism took a lot of really important feminine um gods and um, feminine goddesses um, or feminine celestial beings, or however you want to put it, they took a lot of the Mesoamerican goddesses and turned them evil, made them evil, 
associated them with snakes and made snakes a bad thing. And she's saying that snakes were not always a bad thing among the Aztecs, right, and the Incas. Um, and some of them, some of their most important deities were feminine, or feminine, like uh, Quetzalcoatl, uh, Quetzalcoatl, who she'll talk about later, is like one of the most, the serpent, the woman with the serpent skirt, right? So, and she's going to adopt that, the serpent, she's going to talk about, there's a later slide, and in the book she talks about an incident when she was, young and she was in a cornfield and she was bitten by a snake and she almost died and so instead of interpreting this as she's going to choose to reinterpret that encounter from her life and say that not that wasn't a case of an evil snake almost killing me she's saying that that snake gave her superpowers in a way you know so it it, it kind of put her in touch with her shadow beast and she embraces the snake right and so um and so here, she's alluding to how the very thing that paralyzes women of color can not only be made a source of power, but can be one of comfort, a home against the pressures of what she calls intimate terrorism. So the shadow beast can be a different home. And so don't be afraid of it. So she's saying that it's inside you. It's there. Um, the way that women, especially women of color, deal with sex, have to deal with these restraints in terms of sexuality in general, but also homosexuality and queerness. Like it's there. It's powerful. It can be a, it can be your home, right? It's not something to be afraid of. It's something to embrace. You can embrace, and it can help you, right? So, um, but you have to be strong to do it. You have to like really um, go all in on it. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. Um, so home. She's talking about in chapter two this idea of home. Home, even home, is a ambiguous space for her. So we think of home. We think of safety. We think of a foundation to do all kinds of things but to her a home it can also be a space of terror right and again she's speaking very specifically from the position as a her position as a woman and as a woman of color and i think a lot of people you know and i think this is why a lot of this touches a lot of people this book when i assign it in this class is that you know for a lot of people home is a source of terror especially for women right and we don't talk about that uh, even and we're not even talking about to the level of physical sexual or emotional abuse so the burden of all of these cultural constraints can be a violent, it can be, a, it should, again, that's why she has this term intimate terrorism, right? It can be even in terms of culture, it can be in terms of how limiting these gender categories are. So, so she talks about how, so yes, though home permeates every sinew and cartilage, cartilage in my body, I too am afraid of going home. So she has an ambiguous relationship to this concept of home, right? Um, I, I abhor, I hate some of my culture's ways, how it cripples women like, like donkeys, right? Our strengths use against us, lowly. So our strengths, the very thing that they praise us for, they use it against us, right? Like lowly burras, right? Um, bearing humility with dignity, right? Um, the ability to serve, claim the males, is our highest virtue. I abhor how my culture makes macho, so hates what it does to women, but then, so again, this is why it fits so well with um, Foucault and post-structuralism, is that, so again, power, this is about power, power makes things. So even the people who have the upper hand in a power relationship, that the power that infuses this relationship also makes them too. So she said, I hate how it cripples women, but also hate how it makes macho caricatures of, of its men. Men could be something more, women could be something more, but the men in these relationships can be more too, but they're crippled by this, these macho caricatures. Um, you could relate this to Kondo's work on Orientalism in, in Butterfly, right? Same argument, right? The relationship between Gallimard and Butterfly and M. Butterfly, it cripples both of them, right? It constrains both of them, not just her, it constrains him too, right? So she's saying that here too. I hate what it does to women, but I also hate what it does to men, right? We both could evolve to be something more, right? So, um, so I'll protect my people and I'll defend them, but I will not glorify those aspects of my culture which have injured me and which have injured me in the name of protecting me. So. I will defend my culture. She's saying that I'll defend my culture, but I will not. Um, I will not glorify those aspects that cripple people. So, and again, it's twofold, right? So it makes macho characters of his men, and it and it cripples the women by putting all these burdens on them. Um, and so, how do you unpack this? I want an accounting of all three cultures, white, Mexican, Indian. I want the freedom to carve. And so this is another great quote. This book is just full of these amazing quotes, right? Of turns or phrases. 
Um, I want the freedom to carve and chisel my own face to staunch the bleeding with ashes, to fashion my own gods out of my entrails, right? I want to take my own entrails and, and make my own, like, uh, like, forget all these categories. I want to build my own, my own um, self. Uh, and if going home is denied me, then I will have to stand and claim my space. So if they want, if my community will not accept my queerness, is what she's saying, I have to stand and claim my space, making a new culture, una cultura mestizo, a mestizo culture. That's the subtitle of the book. Uh, with my own lumber, my own bricks and mortar, and my own feminist architecture. So she wants to use feminist architecture to make her own space to be who she is. Um, and, you know, so I love that phrase. I want to carve and chisel my own face uh, to fashion my own gods out of my entrails, right? So, um, okay. So she starts building her own gods out of her own entrails. Um, so, okay, and I'm going to stop after this. I'm just going to make this one last point because I do want to answer questions about the midterm if anyone has any. Um, a lot of these gods, you know, so she starts talking about these old gods um, that were there before and that, that were reinterpreted by the Spanish when they brought Catholicism, right? Um, uh, so she questions, she's saying like some of these people, including uh, Malinale, Tenepat, Malinzin, or La Chingada, I know that's a terrible word if you speak Spanish, like it, it means the fucked one, it's like the worst insult you can call a woman because it um, this person was the person, she was um, Cortez's she was Cortez's translator and she's just kind of um, epithet for whore, prostitute, or a woman who sold out her people to the Spaniards. So she was a translator for Cortez, and people just like uh, that's like the worst thing you can call a woman in Spanish, right? That, or at least in North American Spanish. Um, that North and Central American Spanish, I guess, um, or Western Hemisphere Spanish. I don't know. Like that. But um, so she's saying, like, wait a minute, what? What is she? You know, why? She wants to kind of challenge this idea that what, you know, it's kind of another symbol for the position of mestizo women. So um, it says the worst kind of betrayal lies in making us believe that the Indian woman is the betrayer. So she's saying that basically what this cultural move did was to say that, OK, those of us who have European, those of us like her who have European, Mexican and indigenous blood, uh, La Chinada, this this thing becoming an insult a thing to her an insult to hurl at people it labels the indian in her as the one who betrayed her people so it takes the blame off of the europeans for what they did it's just basically why is it that the indian woman is the the bad guy here in this story and you use it to constrain us more um and so she's saying that the worst kind of betrayal it makes us believe that the Indian woman in us is the betrayer and should be shunned and suppressed. Right? We Indians and mestizos police the Indian in us, brutalize and condemn her. Male culture and male culture has done a good job on us. So this is again, I just think it's just really brilliant how she does this. Um, that she's saying that this, the fact that this is the worst insult in this culture, means that, you know, it's a way again. It's that it's a gaze, right? Like. Panopticon is part of the male gaze. It's part of patriarchy. Um, uh, that it functions as this mechanism to make them repress the Indian and, and be embarrassed about them, to condemn her, to be ashamed of the, of the their Indianness, to condemn them, right? Because this is the part of you that did this awful thing, right? So and again, a lot of it is subconscious um, for her. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop there, but uh, chapter three, if you're interested, I can post it. I don't think I posted it because I only assigned chapter through chapter two, I think. But uh, she talks about how she was bitten by a snake in the field, in the field, and it's just this really great scene of transformation. She's saying that she almost died, but then in the end, she took on the powers of the snake, and it allowed her to to revive this autochthonous. There's that word right from the earth, right? This autochthonous aspects of her identities and so afterwards i smelled where fear had been back of neck under arms between my legs i felt its heat slide down my body i swallowed the rocket i'd hardened into the serpent mitono my animal counterpart was immune i was immune to its venom forever immune right so she's saying that um it kind of inoculated her against this the power of how people assume that it's evil or something that is bad um I know things older than Freud, older than gender. She, that's how I refer to a lot of Vibrona, snake woman, um, like the ancient Olmecs. I knew, I know earth is a coiled serpent, 
40, 40 years it's taken me to enter into the serpent to acknowledge that I have a body, that I am a body, and to assimilate, assimilate the animal body, the animal soul. So again, go back. She's saying we should go back, look at these gods that have been, gods and goddesses that have been suppressed by Catholicism, by the Aztecs when they conquered other people, right? Um, so again, it's just wave after wave for her. Um Okay, I'll post chapter three because some of you may be interested enough to read further. Um, so she talks about Guadalupe, like the history of Guadalupe and how it came from. It was kind of a merging of the Virgin Mary and Coatlalupe, Coatla she who has the dominion over serpents. So, but the Guadalupe, the Catholic part, kind of took over the the um, Aztec part. Um, so she's and she's even descended from earlier Mesoamerican earth goddesses like the earliest is Coatlicue or Serpent Skirt. She was the mother of Celestially and Huichilopochtli and his sister. Man, I can't say these words. Um, um, another, so again, she goes to these different gods. Tonansi, the Tonax, tired of the Aztec human sacrifices to the male god, renewed their reverence for Tonansi, who preferred the sacrifice of birds and small animals. So again, there's this whole history there of domination and resistance, even before the Europeans came. And she's saying that these gods that are out there, even among the Catholicism, in you know, you know, Catholicism is the religion of Mexico, right? And so she's saying the Virgin of Guadalupe has a history behind it. So it's, it's not a coincidence that Guadalupe is there. There's a history, and then there's a history behind the history. And so she just keeps going and going and doing these intellectual archaeology projects. Like it's an intellectual project of archaeology of excavating things. Like and again, that's very much like what Foucault does. Um, so the Azteca Mexico culture drove the powerful female deities underground by giving them monstrous attributes and by substituting male deities in their place, thus splitting the female self and the female deities. They divided her who had been, been complete, who possessed both upper light and underworld dark aspects. Coatlicue, the serpent goddess in her more sinister aspects, uh, Tzatzua, Teodol, and Chihuacuatol were darkened and disempowered much in the same manner as the Indian Kali. Right, so, so again, um, look at chapter three. I mean, it's, again, it's just brilliant. She gets into the gods. She gets into a lot of things. Uh, the second half of the book is mostly poetry. I mean, it's just brilliant stuff, um, but it takes some work to really know what she's talking about. Um, I'm going to stop there because I do want to... Um, I do want to talk about the midterm if you have any questions. So any questions about Anzal Dua before I take the slides away? Uh, again, just speak up. Just unmute yourself and speak up because I don't think I can see everybody right now. Um, okay, so yeah. Uh, all right, I'm going to go back to this view. Uh, all right. Okay, so if there are no questions... Um, Okay, so if you have, like I said, if you have a question, just, um, you know, you can, you know, raise your hand here. You can ask about it now uh, when I open things up to talking about the midterm. So we don't have, we've got about 15 minutes left to talk about the midterm. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen here. Okay, so now I can see who's here. All right. So go ahead. And, you can raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself and talk. And as you do that. I will actually find the midterms here and put it up. So there's the syllabus and here's the midterm. Put that up. Okay, so I'll put the midterm up so everybody can see it. Okay, uh, and then I'm gonna share screen. Okay. All right, so now you can see the midterm questions. These are due, so originally it was due today, but it's going to be due Wednesday. Um, any questions about any of the midterms? Okay, uh, hold on. I can barely see who's here, but I do see a hand. Marco? Yeah, uh, can uh, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, um, how are we turning in the midterm? Are we doing it through the Dropbox, or are we sending it to you through email? Or? It's going to be a Dropbox. I just need to create it. Uh, I didn't put it there just so that uh, people wouldn't wouldn't turn them in before uh, Wednesday. But I will create a Dropbox, and it will automatically go to the midterm to create 
area. So uh, when I put it, so if you put it in the drop Dropbox, I'll grade it there, and then you'll grade will go to the grade book from there. So um, again, I'll create it tonight probably. So if you want to turn it in tomorrow, that's fine. Uh, but it won't technically be due until midnight on Wednesday. So um, if that answers your question, I just need um, Dropbox have to be manually created. I just haven't done it yet. Okay, that's good. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, any other questions about the midterm? Uh, okay, so you can see it here. Um, da, 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 da. No logo, Klein, time and space. You can go back to nationalism. You can talk about Saeed, uh, Madama Butterfly, that stuff. Um, you could pick a movie and analyze it in terms of sight of uh, Kondo's, you know, Kondo's work. Um, uh, okay, so number five, racial identities and levels. Um, subject position, uh, you can use Ong, not Ong, Ong is not that. You can use Kondo. Ong is not, I didn't assign Ong this semester. So, but, uh, okay, am I seeing something? All right. All right, so, um, uh, da, 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 da. what's taking the place of nationalism what's being produced in its wake like what's happening to nationalism is still there but what does it have to compete with and how does it do that um, so you can look at uh, no logo for that um, what is identity kind of an in, I, number one that's an, that's um, you know up until now as we talked about it what's your impression of what identity is I'm not looking for an official definition um, I wouldn't start number one off with, you know, the Oxford Dictionary defines identity. It's like, well, you know, you've heard more than Oxford Dictionary in this class. So um, don't worry about a, an official. I just want to hear your impression and what is it based on. So um, if you notice from my comments from all the papers from midterm one, um, you know, my thing is engage with class materials, right? I'm not looking for, I want you to express yourself i want to hear what you think but always try to tie it back to i don't want to just hear a free form discussion which is you can integrate that stuff but make sure you tie it to a lecture or to a reading um or something you know something from the class uh even if it's just one i think that's fine uh it's been a little bit difficult because normally when i come to class when we were meeting in person i would have a way to clean up whatever i missed or something so it's a little bit more difficult in this format and we're less interactive here we will have a chance to talk about stuff on wednesday so if you have any questions about the midterm and you're just not done then wednesday at 11 o'clock you'll have a chance to ask more um and work on it and it's not due during class time it's just due anytime on wednesday so uh, yeah if, any questions or anything if there are no questions i you know i can stop here i'm really hungry i need to eat lunch so i don't know about y'all but i always write you know keep washing your hands wear a mask if you go out if you need to go out i know people need to go out so hang in there and yeah i'll post any kind of policy things like credit no credit stuff like that you know i said this before i'll say it again i wouldn't worry about my grades too much this semester because this is totally we weren't prepared to teach online so we're just doing what we can. I mean, even for you're going to have uh, all of your classes, you're going to you're still going to do faculty evaluations, those spot summaries at the end. We're not even going to use them. We have to do them legally, uh, but we're going to do them electronically. Uh, they're going to send them to you and then you fill them out, do fill them out. But like we who when we evaluate faculty, we're not even going to use them. So it's like we've decided we're just not we're going to do them but we won't use them to so you know it's, we don't want them to hurt people's performance reviews like for teaching so um yeah so i'll and that you know i'll let you know uh, what you can do so again the no credit no credit thing is this if you really feel like you're going to fail or you just can't do the work um you can do no credit um talk to me if you turn in a couple of the papers you could do an incomplete if it comes to that I prefer not to because we're going to have a ton of incompletes this year and it's really hard to come back and finish a class. So we could work something out. You can go no credit or you just get credit. If you think you're going to make a C and you don't want to see, you can just get credit. So um, credit means if you needed to take the class for your ma major or for GE, you get those three units. You can check off that thing. You just and it. You just don't get a grade. It just means you get a neutral. It's a neutral score. So and if in the future, 
you need to apply for a job in, let's say it's in anthropology and it's like, hey, you've got these two anthropology classes that you don't have a grade for, it's just credit. We won't hire someone unless you have a grade, you need a grade for those. And then you can come back to the university five years from now and get that grade changed to a B or an A or something, if that's what you made. And you will know at the end of the semester what grades you would made, you would have made if you didn't have credit, no credit. So, and you can change it back. <laughs> so, so it's kind of crazy. We're trying to adapt. It's, it's, you know, no one knows exactly what they're doing right now. So um, hang in there and I'm going to log off and I'll see y'all Wednesday. Um, I don't Come to office hours if you, let's see, what are my office hours? Uh, my office hours are, um, so Monday, so today two to three, I have office hours and I'll just have my room open. Uh, how many people think they'll come to office hours later? Just so I can anticipate, I might be away from my computer, but have it open. Okay, what time, Brianna, do you think you'll come? <laughs> I don't know, just whenever. Okay, if you don't see me, just uh, send me an email or text or something because uh, I might not be in front of my computer but I'll have the room open with the camera off so I'll just be looking I'll just keep checking to see if it's just like my office right like um, I'll just check to see if anybody's there so uh, that's two to three so office hours are Monday two to three and then again Thursday 10 to 11 uh, and if you have any other questions outside of that you can email me I'm on email all day every day so cool all right well I'll see you later I hope that made sense. You know, I'll post this video later. You can go back to it. Um, I'm recording all of this right now. So this will be posted as a video to Beachboard. So, all right. All right. I'll see y'all later. Stop share. Okay. All right. We're going to end the meeting.